Alright guys, so in the previous video we started kind of just introducing integrals in terms of why do we use them, where did they come from, and, uh, and what's kind of the purpose of them. Um, in, in this first lesson of chapter 5, which is all about integrals, we said our goals were to estimate the distance traveled and find area under a curve by an approximation method called the rectangular approximation method. Okay, so again, I want to say we're going to get to a a way to solve integrals that is a lot easier, in my opinion, and it makes a little bit more sense. Before we get there, I just I really want to continue to push why we are finding integrals and really what does the integral actually mean. And so we're going to spend a little bit of time on this before we dive into, quote unquote, the easier way out of things, okay? So let's start off by looking into what this is rectangular approximation method is. If you remember correctly, we finished our last video off by saying, well, if I'm finding the area under a curve of a steady velocity like you see right in here, well, it's super simple to sit there and just say, hey, well, it's 75 the whole time, so the height is going to be 75, and the base is going to be 2 because I went from 7 to 9, and boom, 150, or 75 times 2 is 150. But then we started posing the question, well, what if it's not a steady velocity the entire way, and it's something more where it's got a curve under it? you still need to make the relationship between the instantaneous rate of change the entire way from A to B. But how can you do that when it's not a steady pace? Well, we do what's called an approximation. Because these rectangles that I've drawn right here, all right, and I get the tops are not exactly rectangles, all right, but we can make them rectangles and get an approximation. This makes it a lot easier area formula than whatever this shape actually creates. And so that's what we're going to dive into today as to how to use the rectangular approximation method. And in this first example, we're going to look into what's called the MRAM, stands for the midpoint rectangle approximation method. All right? So we're going to be focusing on using the rectangle approximation method by the midpoint itself. It's going to give us a good approximation. It may not give us the best approximation, but it's a good starting point in my opinion. I think it's a good it's a good one to kind of get our get our feet wet and to see exactly where we're going here. So the first example is talking about finding the distance traveled when velocity varies. It states that a particle starts at x equals zero and moves along the x-axis with the velocity that represents v of t equaling t squared. So that's our velocity or our first derivative, right? <clears throat> For a web long as t is greater than or equal to zero, because obviously it can't be negative. It wants to know where is the particle when t equals 3. So let's think about this question for a second. The, the problem itself, the function is not t squared, okay? The derivative of the function was t squared. So we got to think into account here. It's not just, hey, throw in t and then boom, you're going to see that the answer is, you know, whatever it is. So we kind of just need to be a little bit careful on that because we're trying to find out specifically what the function itself is going to be when t is 3. Because remember, the particle is about the position of it, all right? So where is it x value going to be? for f of x or x of x or s of x or whatever it is, all right, when t, now the independent variable for velocity, is 3. So like I said, we use what is called the MRAM, all right, the midpoint rectangle approximation method. What you see in this diagram is the curve of the velocity from 0 to 3 in partition. We have cut this up into 12 different partitions. And I know I have some terrible at drawing, but these are not good representations of rectangles, but imagine they are all perfect rectangles, okay? And what this has done is this has shown 12 rectangles, giving us a new change of t, making different intervals happen, okay? So, what we're going to do is we're going to take this and 
start approximating what the area under the curve is going to be by using every single one of these rectangles, okay? So the chart that I'm going to show you how to solve this with, I'm only going to dive into the first four or so, and then you're going to see the formula will start to come to fruition, so you can kind of do the rest of the ones on your own. Now, 12 is a lot. A lot of problems don't have you do 12 partitions. But think about it. The, the more partitions you have, the better approximation you're going to get. Because you're getting smaller and smaller as you get there, okay? So let's take a look here. So why is it called the midpoint RAM, all right? So M RAM. Because what we are going to use is we are going to use the midpoint of each one of the intervals. So the first interval that is created from these partitions is 0 to 1 fourth, okay? Where did I get 1 fourth from? Well, think about it. If the entire interval goes from 0 to 3 and there's 12 partitions, 3 divided by 12 is 3 over 12 or simplifying down to 1 fourth. So that means from 0 to the first one represents 0 to 1 fourth. And then you go from 1 fourth to 1 half, and then from 1 half to 3 fourths, and so on and so forth. And so we're going to be looking for the midpoints between 0 and 1 fourth. So I'm going to put over here the midpoint of each of these. So we're going to look from 0 to 1 fourth. We're going to look from 1 fourth to 1 half. We're going to look from 1 half to 3 fourths. And then the last one we're going to look at is from 3 fourths to 1, all right? And what we're going to see, like I said, is you're going to see a, a formula start to fruition so that you can do from 1 to 1 fourth on your own and from 1 fourth, or 1 and 1 fourth to 1 and 1 half and so on and so forth on your own. So let's take a look. The midpoint between 0 and 1 fourth. Well, divide that by 2, that's going to be an 8. Okay? The midpoint between 1 fourth and 1 half, once again, add them up, divide by 2, you're going to get 3 eighths. And then between a half and 3 fourths, once again, find the average, you're going to have 5 eighths. And then lastly, between 3 fourths and 1, you're going to find 7 eighths. Okay? I mean, just think about what's happening there. I mean, it just, you're going in fourths, so and now you're going to be going in eighths to find those midpoints. Okay? So hopefully we can see, you know, what's happening in there. Okay. So now, if I'm finding the area of a rectangle, that's base times height, well, the midpoint will represent the base of what we are talking about, right? So the midpoint is going to represent our base kind of part of things. But what is going to be our height in this case? All right, what's going to be our height in this case? Well, if I want to find the height, the height is going to be best represented by finding out what the velocity is at the midpoint, okay? So wherever that midpoint is, 1, 8, 3, 8, 5, 8, 7, 8, I am going to plug that in to V of T. So V of T is going to equal our height. All right, so V of T is going to equal our height here. So throwing in 1 8 into t squared, or that's going to be, let's get a different color going on here, that's going to be 1 over 64, and then you're throwing 3 8 in, that's going to be 9 over 64, then you have 5 8, so 25 over 64, and then finally 49 over 64. So what this is, yeah, this is the height of each of these rectangles to a good, a good best approximation, okay? And so we know that the base, the distance from each interval, the delta t, the change in t, well, that's a fourth everywhere. From 0 to 1 fourth, the change is 1 fourth. So each of these spots that I'm marking down here represent delta t or change of t, which is 1 fourth from 1 on down to the x. So what I'm really doing is I'm taking 1 fourth and I'm multiplying it by the height, which is the midpoint squared in this particular example, okay? So let's go ahead and find out what each of these areas of these little intervals are going to be. 
So right now, I'm looking basically at the height multiplied by one-fourth, okay? So really, I'm taking one-fourth, and I'm multiplying it by each of the heights. And so let's change the colors again to kind of get a little bit of different here. So now I'm taking 1 4 multiplying by 64, one, 1 over 64. That's 1 over 256. And then 1 4 times 9 over 64 is going to be 9 over 256. Uh, and then 1 4 times 25 over 64 is 25 over 256. And then obviously this will also be 49 over 256 here. Okay, so now what I've done is I have found the areas of, let's go, I'll go ahead and put in a different color here, all right? I've gone ahead and I've found the areas, let me get back down there, I've gone ahead and found the areas from zero to a fourth, from a fourth to a half, from a half to one, from one to one quarter, and so on and so forth. So I have found the areas of all of these spots that I'm shading in right now. Okay, well really I've found the first four, but using the formula I can find all 12 of them, okay? And so just because you can kind of see what the formula is, it's one fourth times the height, I'm gonna kind of skip a little bit, just so we don't have to spend so much time watching me multiply these numbers out together, okay? If I wanted to find the area under this blue curve, all I need to do is add the areas that we know. So I'm going to find the sum of all of the one-fourth times the heights. So this looks like 1 over 256 plus 9 over 256 plus 25 over 256 plus... 49 over 256, and keeping them going, once again, this is kind of the, the, the skipping part of things, but you can easily double check these. So now you have 81 over 256 for your next one, and then your next one you've got 121 over 256, and then your next one is going to be 169 over 256, and then 225 over 256. And then 289 over 256. And just kind of keep going on down. And then you've got 361 over 256. And then 441 over 256. And then finally 529 over 256. This comes out to be about 2300 over 256 with an approximation of 8.98, okay? And so to answer the question that it says, where is the particle at t equals 3? The particle is roughly at the value x equals 9, okay? I need to emphasize this. It is roughly at the point when x equals 9. Not when t equals 9, but x. Remember, t is the in independent variable of the derivative velocity. Okay? x, x is going to be specifically, all right, where it's traveling down that x-axis for position. Okay? So we can kind of finish up and answer this question by saying roughly or approximately at x equals 9. That is when the t equals 3 will give us a position for this particle. Okay, t equals 3. When the time hit 3, the position of the particle was roughly at x equals 9. Okay, so that is using our midpoint ram. Alright, m ram, midpoint rectangle approximation method there, okay? What we're going to start looking into a little bit further is how to use and incorporate what's called an LRAM, an RRAM, and kind of see which one gives us a better approximation, okay? So hang on to that, and um, on to the next video we go.